I work a lot in, in education. I have done my entire life. It's where I'm from uh, professionally and, um, and uh, spiritually, really. My, my home is in education. And for as long as I can remember, I've been worried about it. I was worried about it when I was in it. So that's an early start, isn't it? I remember sitting there thinking, what's this? <laughs> Why are we doing this? I can't remember. Um, I went to, uh, I was asked about this recently, uh, about how I got started. So actually, I asked myself about it. I was, I was, nobody else asked me, so I asked myself. It's a good. <laughs> I often speak to myself. It's the only way of getting somebody to agree with me, frankly. But. No, but I, uh, I went to a special school, they used to be called. Uh, I always think about this recently. Uh, I wrote a book a while ago called The Element, uh, How Finding Your Passion Changes Everything. And, uh, and Terry, my wife, we've been together for 35 years, she said, you should tell your story in the book. And I said, why? I don't think it's that interesting, really. Anyway, she insisted, and, um, and it turned out to be fascinating. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> if I say so myself, I was riveted. <laughs> no, but I got... Uh, until I was four, uh, I was all set to, uh, well, listen, my family was convinced I was going to be a soccer player. My father was, anyway, because uh, I was fit and you know, fast and um, deeply attractive. <laughs> Two other four-year-olds, anyway. And so it's remained, actually, ever since. <laughs> Anyway, I got polio when I was four. And uh, so that put an end to my soccer career, really, with Everton. Uh, it wouldn't do now, by the way. I, mean, I, think, I think I'd have a good chance of making the team these days, the way they're going on. But, <laughs> but <laughs> if you've been watching their performance recently. But um, anyway, I went to this special school and, uh, for a few years. And, uh, and I was, I suppose, discovered there by a school inspector, a rather wonderful man called Charles Strafford. Uh, who saw something in me, I don't know, and encouraged the school to take more of an interest. But the reason I mention it is, I suppose I've been struck from any age by how different we are and how deeply um, hidden often our talents are and our abilities, that we all have tremendous natural talents and often people don't know them, they don't recognise them and they don't uh, develop them. They, and to the extent that they don't know what their talents are, they don't really know what they can do. And to the extent they don't know that, they don't really know who they are, I believe. I think that's true of all of us. And uh, I felt at the time that the kids I was in the class with, and me as well, probably, we, we were branded, in a way, by a single fact. It's like people get branded by their gender, or they get branded by their ethnicity, or they get branded by their religion. You know, uh, there's an old um, uh, grammatical uh, uh, device called a... I call it, is it, I used to call it synecdoche at school, synecdoche, isn't it? Where a single item of something is taken to represent the whole of it. Like in Shakespeare, they'll say a mast, meaning a ship. And I think we have this uh, kind of synecdochal thinking all the time about each other. We take a single facet of somebody and extrapolate from it and, and believe that's the whole of them somehow. It's convenient to, to brand them that way. Well, I was in school with kids who had cerebral palsy, uh, they had uh, uh, asthma, and the guy who sat next to me uh, had um, spasticity. He couldn't hold a pen in his hand, he could only hold it in his feet. But he did it beautifully, actually. Uh, so he had, and he did actually have much better handwriting than I did. Was it handwriting? We don't know. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> what was he doing? We don't know. <laughs> Anyway, whatever it was, he was great at it. And there's a guy next to me who had hydrocephalus, my friend Robert, uh, all kinds of people. I was saying that our classroom was like the barroom scene from Star Wars. You know, there were... <laughs> it was. Uh, people wandering around with bits detached and falling off. And <laughs> we had a monitor for it. We had a body parts monitor, you know. <laughs> Other schools had people clearing the way they chalk. We'd say, just collect whatever's dropped off with you. <laughs> but the thing was, you see, that, that, that it wasn't what was of interest to any of us in the class. What interested us was whether people were interesting or 
funny or had something to say, you know, whether they entertained you or engaged you, it was that, that stuff. Uh, but I felt that for a long time, I mean afterwards, that, that that's not quite how it was seen from the outside. Well, um, in a way, special education, I suppose, ever since, has struck me as a particular example of a much more general principle, which is that we do that to everybody. And education does it to everybody, one way or another. We have stereotypes in our minds about what counts as ability, what counts as success, what counts as normal, um, and we apply them everywhere. They're often just built into our mental furniture. We don't even know we're doing it half the time. So a lot of what I've been arguing for, I suppose, during my life is for a, a more thoroughgoing principle of diversity in education, that human life thrives on diversity. And our education systems are modeled, ironically, on the principle of conformity. And it's why so many people don't do terribly well at it. People who could do a lot better. A lot of people go through education, never discover what they're good at at all, or conclude that they're just not good. I think of this um, as uh, the other climate crisis. What I mean is that we've become used, to, at least I hope we have, to the idea that there is a crisis in the world's natural resources. I mean, there is. I think if people doubt it, just wait. You know, <laughs> you know it's a waiting game, this. Um, but I think there's a... And by the way, that, that crisis in the natural climate has been caused by us. We know that. Let me ask you, how many people do you think have ever lived on Earth? How many human beings do you think there have been? I, I, mean, I don't mean troglodytes and Neanderthals. I mean modern human beings, homo sapiens, you know, groovy people <laughs> like ourselves. You know, with, with cocktail shakers and, <laughs> and credit cards, you know. Now, now, um, seriously, how many people do you think that... It's, re it's estimated that human beings emerged on the planet in our modern form um, about 50,000 years ago. So how many, how many of us do you think there are, have been, altogether? Thank you very much. <laughs> do I hear ten? <laughs> Gone. Seven million? Eight billion. Oh, don't be, you're getting silly now. <laughs> no, go on, how many? Any advance on eight billion? Fifteen billion, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, all to the gentleman. <laughs> well, let me tell you. First off, nobody knows, okay? Well, they don't. I mean, how are they going to know? <laughs> no, nobody's been counting. You know, nobody's been... Nobody's going round with a calculator going, oh, four more over here. <laughs> Hang on, you, you two separate a second. No, six, it's six. No. But, what with us being so smart as a species, people have been trying to figure it out. And if you Google the question, how many people have ever lived? you find that estimates by serious people uh, with poor social lives <laughs> have, <laughs> have resulted in a series of estimates. And the estimates range from uh, 60 billion to 110 billion. So it's a bit of a margin. So let's split the difference. Let's split the difference and say maybe 80 billion. Maybe 80 billion people have lived in the whole of history, the last 50,000 years. Well, there are two things to say about it. The first is this, that of those, almost 10% of the total is on Earth right now. We, we are the biggest single generation. I mean, everybody living. I don't mean people over 30, people under 12. I mean, all of us. This collective cohort of humanity is, there are almost 7 billion of us. That's more people than have ever been on the planet at the same time in the whole of human history. And we're heading for 9 billion by the middle of the century, so around 10% of the total. For most of history, there was hardly anybody around, honestly. If you go back to Shakespeare's day, uh, or go back to the High Renaissance in Florence, I mean, Florence you know, was probably about the size of Red Deer. You know, <laughs> it was, just warmer. If Florence had been in Alberta, the Renaissance would not have happened. 
It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Because nobody would have ventured outdoors, would they? Nobody would have... <laughs> They'd all be home inventing electric blankets and things like that. <laughs> but we are now... The population has rocketed in the past 300 years, pretty much. Last 250, really. And growing exponentially. Well, there was a study done, actually a great programme by uh, David Attenborough, uh, done recently. He said if... Uh, the question was, how many people can live on Earth? How many people can the planet sustain? And he came to the following conclusion, which is that if everybody on Earth consumed food, water, fuel, at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 15 billion. But if everybody on Earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in North America, that's us, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.2 billion. And we're at 15 billion, uh, sorry, we're at 7 billion and counting. And honestly, the only reason we're getting away with it is because they're putting up with it, or they're not really aware of it. So what it comes to for me is this, that we are living in times of revolution, and over the next 50 years, we'll face challenges which no previous generation of humanity has ever had to deal with. And to do that, we have to think differently about ourselves and about the, the way we run our communities and our schools and our education systems and our, uh, our organisations. I think we should always have thought differently about it. I think if we thought differently about it in the first place, we wouldn't have so many of these problems. You see, I think of this as the, as say, the other climate crisis. We're creating one, but we're also victims of another which is, I think of, as the crisis of human resources, that most people have no real idea what they're capable of. And it, it plays out in pretty disastrous ways sometimes. Um, for I mean, there are lots of symptoms of this. Uh, one of them is the uh, high levels of dropout from education. Now, I know it varies. I, I'm not speaking about British Columbia now. I mean, I, I live in America, where the dropout rate is 40%. Uh, from public schools, 40% in public schools. I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, uh, but you see similar figures, not just in dropout rates, but in disaffection, in disengagement of people who can't be bothered. You know, suicide rates, especially among people from 15 to 20, are at historically high levels. Um, and four times as many young men commit suicide around the world as women. Uh, it's, it's the fourth largest cause of death among young people. Suicide. There's people checking out for whatever. And everyone has their own story, of course. I mean, there isn't, you can look at generalities. But among the things that people believe are the lack of social cohesion, uh, the breakdown of the family, unemployment, few prospects, and a whole suite of depressive conditions. There are 631 million young people on Earth at the moment, actually between 15, I think, and 25. And of those, 81 million, or about 13%, are unemployed. So people, are the International Labour Organization talks about this, about a lost generation. You know what I'm talking about, and people who, uh, who don't know what to do, the, do with themselves. In America, one in 31 people is in jail. One in 31. In jail or on the way to jail or leaving jail. Well, you see, uh, this to me is a catastrophe. Uh, and you know the price we pay mopping it all up and trying to deal with it. And um, it, 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 to me, it need not happen. I mean, everyone has their own story. You know, there are 80 billion of us and we all have our own biographies. And that's my point, really. We all chart, chart very different courses, of course, through our lives. But one of the biggest influences, I'm not saying education is responsible for these things, but education could be the solution. And too often, I don't mean individual schools or individual teachers or anybody in particular, but systemically, taking it as a whole, as a system, education doesn't contribute to the solution to these problems as thoroughly as it could. In fact, in ways that it should not, it contributes to the problem. 
it makes it worse. And that's why I want to come and talk about this business of educating the heart and the mind. Um, I, I was born in Liverpool. I, I mention this because it's nearly 10 minutes since I mentioned myself. And <laughs> no, you get palpitations, don't you? Don't you? <laughs> no, it can get you badly. No, I was born in Liverpool in, uh, in 1950. And my brother John, at the moment, is doing our family tree. It's not much of a tree, really. It's a kind of small shrub, really, with a <laughs> curious blight around, <laughs> around the roots. But John discovered something very interesting to me, which was that our eight great-grandparents were all born in Liverpool in the mid-19th century within two miles of each other. That's how they met. They bumped into each other. That's how people used to meet the people they spent their lives with. People, until quite recently, led very local lives. Now, you might say, no, 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 this is nonsense. This is not what happened. The, this was the cosmos at work in its secret ways, that these eight soulmates... <laughs> it was contrived. Coincided at the same point in the space-time continuum, that they should further the process that has led to the miracle that is me. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can say that. I don't think so myself. I, I just think people had lower standards then, frankly. I think, I think people bumped into each other and thought, you'll do. <laughs> you know, this is... <laughs> yeah, you are not too shoddy. I can spend my life with you without, without feeling embarrassed, the rest of it. The reason I say this, I mean, think of all the people, all the people of those 80 billion over the past 50,000 years, in the most extraordinary circumstance, how many of those people had to meet each other and did meet each other and procreated down the centuries in a sequence that has finally led to you, to all the different relatives and ancestors who, on the top of which pyramid you currently sit, all the things that had to happen, the chance meetings, the places, the meals, you know, and latterly the movies and the bottles of Sancerre, you know, or <laughs> the expensive chocolates, you know, or, and all the things that may have stopped people meeting, you know, the wars, the catastrophes, the natural, all the stuff that had to happen before you made it. Uh, it's extraordinary. It's something the Dalai Lama said. He said that to be born at all is a miracle. So congratulations, you know, you made it. <laughs> we made it, guys, you know, so... And what he also said is, so what are you going to do with this life? Now you have it, what are you going to do with it? You know, many people never got the chance, and here you are, so what are you going to do? Are you going to do something with it or fritter it away? And education is meant to be the process by which we engage people in their fullness to give them a sense of who they are and their capabilities so they can lead a life that means something to them and to the rest of us. And too often, it simply doesn't. And we end up with lots of remedial programs or people being half-educated or uh, willfully pulling away from it, um, leading to what I say I think of as this, you know, the other climate crisis, and, and certainly contributing to it. Um, there are causes for this. And I think the remedy lies in the type of work we're here to talk about this evening that we'll talk about when uh, Lynn and Maria and I get together as well. But let, let me just sketch out what I think the problem is. The problem, as I see it, is in the ideology of education. It, what, what I mean is the values and assumptions that are taken for granted, the things that we don't think about so much, but which um, uh, kind of calibrate our actions. There are two in particular. One of them, and I've talked a lot about it, is this idea of standardization and conformity. I don't want to go on about it now, but, um, but let, let me just ask you a question. Um, well, I, I, I'll make a point, really. The, the first is, is this, that um, I believe that what we've developed in our education systems is analogous to what's happening in the catering industry. You know, in the catering industry, there are two modes of business and two methods of quality assurance. There's the fast food business, and there's, like, the Michelin Guide. With fast food, 
if you've got a favorite outlet, you know, whichever one you go to, you know exactly what you're going to get. No matter where it is, you can get the same food, the same burger, the same fries, the same bun, the same cola, you know, the same chicken nuggets. What are chicken nuggets, by the way? Do you know? <laughs> what, are, what? what are they? Terry and I used to live in the countryside and we had chickens. They did not have nuggets. <laughs> they did. They didn't. Or if they had them, they weren't showing them. I mean, they were, they were keeping them out of sight, I can tell you. Anyway, do not eat chicken nuggets. The result is that whichever fast food outlet you go to, you know exactly what you're going to get. It's all horrible and bad for your health, but it's guaranteed. The, the, and it's contributing to the worst outbreak of diabetes and obesity in the history of the planet, but hey. The, um, the other form of quality assurance in catering is uh, like the Michelin Guide, and that's very different. They set up criteria of excellence, and they say if you meet these criteria, you're in the guide. It doesn't matter what food you serve. You can be an Italian, French, Asian, fusion, it doesn't matter. You can all be in the guide. Uh, they don't tell you what time to open. They don't tell you what uniforms to wear or to have uniforms, whether to serve wine or not. You meet these criteria in your own way. And the consequence is, under that system, you get very high-level restaurants with great, uh, great stuff to eat in every type of genre and culture, and they're all different. Now, I think what's been happening over time in education is it's becoming more and more standardized. It's becoming more like the fast food model, uh, when it ought to be much more like the Michelin model. Every school should be different and great. Every classroom should be different and great. It should be built on diversity and not conformity. And one of the symptoms, I think, uh, is becoming more and more worrying. Can I ask you, how many of you here would consider yourself to be baby boomers? Come on. Thank you. Me too. Um, well, you know, how many of you, if you don't mind me asking, have had your tonsils removed? <laughs> there we go. That's a lot, isn't it? How many of you here are under the age of 30? You know what I'm saying? How many of you have had your tonsils removed? There you go. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? As a proportion, you see, our generation, the boomers, routinely had our tonsils removed, <laughs> didn't we? When you were a kid, the first sign of a sore throat, <laughs> somebody would pounce on you and take your tonsils out. <laughs> they did. When I was a teenager, you couldn't afford to clear your throat in public. <laughs> or someone would be on you and whip your tonsils out. <laughs> and your adenoids and, and your appendix, any loose bit of flesh they couldn't account for. <laughs> Isn't that true? Anything that was lying around, out it would come and it'd be stacked in the corner of the surgery for collection later on. What happened to all the tonsils? What are chicken nuggets? Really, I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> what are they? <laughs> we, <laughs> we should be told. We should be told it's a conspiracy. No, the thing is that, <laughs> that it was a false epidemic. It was invented by the medical profession. People still get sore throats. They still get inflamed tonsils, but they don't whip them out anymore as witness the fact people under 30 have mostly got them. Uh, they let them heal, they give them, there are other ways of treating them. It was a fad, just a fad. You know, what, a tonsillitis, take the tonsils out. People used to have their entire sets of teeth removed because they needed a filling. That's what people did. It's a, it's a medical contagion that runs through the profession. Our kids don't suffer from that, the kids in your classrooms. They do suffer from a new false epidemic, I believe, which is the plague of ADHD. Now, I don't mean to say, and I've said it elsewhere, that there is no such thing. People agree, who are qualified to pronounce these things, that there is a suite of conditions called ADHD. What I contest is its status as, a, as an epidemic. And there are studies around which support that view. There's one published recently, you can read about it on CNN. They reckon in the United States last year, maybe 900,000 children were falsely diagnosed with ADHD. Often, apparently, if, you, if the kids who are youngest in the class will be diagnosed with ADHD, if they're in, in, they're, because they stand out more, they may have more restless energy.
But you know, I, I speak to lots of people about it. I was speaking to somebody recently who said a son was being diagnosed with ADHD. And um, I said, what does he like to do? He said, oh, he, he loves to uh, play the guitar and write songs. And I said, does he lose interest when he's doing that? She said, oh, no, no, he'll sit there for hours doing that. <laughs> so part of it is this obsession with conformity. We now have a suite of narcotics or drugs available uh, which can help people stay within the barriers. Um, so standardization is a big issue. I think we should be personalizing education, not standardizing it. Uh, on the basis that we're all different. But there's something else which is at the heart of our academic culture. Our education systems have evolved really based on many of the, the intellectual principles of the European Enlightenment. And uh, that way of thinking, which has many benefits and of course has produced spectacular success in science and technology and the rest, is nonetheless predicated on a division between intellect and feeling. Um, if you read a lot of the architects of the Enlightenment, the whole burden of it, the whole drive of the Enlightenment was to push out uh, intuition and superstition, only reason and objective facts would do. Um, Hume and others write about uh, keeping feelings away from our attempts to understand the world. And that view, and we can talk a bit more about it later on, has contributed to, I think, a schismatic view of, of human beings. We have developed a view of the mind which is based on a particular view of rationality. And we've come to mistake the mind, that entity that consciously thinks, with consciousness, which is the broader character of our being. We can engage with the world in many other ways than are made available through our normal systems of education. In fact, the meditative religions, the tradition in which the Dalai Lama Center sits and others, um, are dedicated to the proposition that there is, in a sense, more to us than the conventional sense of a thinking mind. Uh, Eckhart Tolle, who lives in the city uh, is a, and is a friend of ours, I'm actually doing uh, a program with him on Saturday. If you've re read his book, uh, A New Earth or The Power of Now, is also dedicated to that proposition that, that um, we can apprehend ourselves and the world uh, more effectively uh, if we don't depend upon or uh, collide our association of consciousness with this rather narrow view of the rational mind. The other thing that comes from this is a division between thinking and feeling. And I, I've been a long-time advocate of the arts in education. Um, and the arts are always at the bottom of the pecking order in schools. So when cuts begin to uh, be talked of in education, or when standardization becomes the order of the day, the hierarchy of schools becomes apparent. You know, maths and science at the top, and languages, and then the humanities and the arts get pushed further and further down. And in, in the arts, there's another hierarchy, music and art are normally given a better place than theatre and dance. And it's partly because we've also become to associate uh, those other disciplines with, and particularly science and mathematics, with hard knowledge, and the arts with a softer form of knowledge. Uh, the arts, for some people, are seen as being less rigorous, not really knowing at all. Uh, some form of self-expression, some form of recreation, some form of leisure. And it's a terrible caricature of how the arts actually work. And we've also, in a way, disembodied our children. We've become to focus on them as minds in a head, rather than as people embodied. I, I, a very good example of this, we have two kids, so far as I know. <laughs> how would I know? I mean, sorry. no. And our son James is great. Um, our daughter Kate is also great. <laughs> our two children who are equally great, <laughs> of whom one is called James. When he was 16, James asked us if um, he was taking some exams at school in England. Uh, and he said, 
he wanted to get um, a PlayStation, a Sony PlayStation. And he said, if I do well in the exams, can I get a PlayStation? And Terry and I said, no, you cannot. He said, but all my friends are getting things, you know, for doing well in the exams. We said, well, great. He said, well, you know, so what's going to be my motivation? <laughs> I said, we'll be thrilled. <laughs> we, uh, we both said. Terry is much more uh, astute on these things than I was. Um, but push for this. Anyway, we didn't bribe him, but after he got his exams, he, and he did well, he said to us, you know, could I, could I have a PlayStation? It's like a few weeks later. And I said to Terry, I think, I think we should get him one, you know, because I wanted one. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I thought we should have a PlayStation. Anyway, we should have a PlayStation. The house is not complete. Anyway, so we got, we got this PlayStation. And I, uh, I spent an hour upstairs in, in James's room fixing the thing up. I mean, this was 10 years ago. So I was fixing up this PlayStation. And, uh, and I got the thing working. I mean, it would have done it without me, probably a lot faster, but I'm a dad, you know. <laughs> Sit there, my boy. <laughs> Grasshopper, you know. And, and I will do this. <laughs> anyway, so I went downstairs, and Kate was in the kitchen. We lived in the countryside at the time. And she said, uh, would you make me a swing? She was 12 then, so I said, uh, okay. Um, I th I might, uh, perhaps they were 14 and 10. Okay. Anyway, so I went out, and she found this 15-foot piece of rope in the shed. We, had, we did have this apple tree outside the door, so I rigged up a swing. I put a piece of wood across the bottom of it, and she was on the swing playing. An hour or two later, James came down to get a, a drink, a glass of water or something, and, and he saw Kate outside, and he said, what's that? I said, I've made her a swing. So he dashed out. And he spent the whole of the rest of the afternoon on the swing <laughs> with Kate. In fact, they spent the whole week and went on to spend most of the summer on the swing in the garden. Swinging back and forward, so they, they kind of created this ditch underneath them, <laughs> destroyed the grass. Uh, most of the apples fell off. But they were doing Star Wars, Cirque du Soleil, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, 10 years before the movie came out. <laughs> I think we're still owed royalties for it. Um, Harry, Potter, you know, they were doing, they were just lost in this fantasy world and they were exhilarated by the whole thing. And of course, the reason was it was a physical, embodied activity which was firing up their imagination. It wasn't just all here, it was a full, physical, embodied experience. And I just found it fascinating. Terry and I were saying it, it's interesting, it's because I, th I think if we'd said to James in the June, you know, James, if you do really well in your exams, you can have that piece of old rope in the shed, you know. <laughs> I'm not sure it would have been the incentive he was looking for, frankly. But there is something about the physicality of that type of play. Well, there, is, there are legion reports now from every quarter about uh, emotional dysfunction. Daniel Goleman, you know, wrote famously the book Emotional Intelligence. There was a book written actually 1974 by a guy called Robert Witkin, which had a title with the same meaning, but it was expressed differently. He called his book The Intelligence of Feeling. And he begins it by saying, you know, Descartes' thing that you know, I think, therefore I am, uh, which is a contestable argument right there, but Wittgen said, perhaps we would be better saying, I feel, therefore I am. That we are, above all, feeling organisms. We are organic. But he makes a very interesting point at the beginning of the book, uh, which is an obvious enough point, but he says that, and he speaks in a long tradition in saying it, is that we all live in, uh, in two worlds. There is a world that exists, that existed before you existed, and all being well would exist after you have ceased to be. Because in the end, we're not here for long. You know, in, in terms of the history of the planet, the planet is four and a half billion years old. And we've been here for 50,000 years. Apparently, if you were to liken the whole history of the planet, the lifespan of the planet, to a single year, human beings appeared on the planet at one second to midnight on the 31st of December. There's a great piece on The Onion recently about save the planet, you know, commenting on everyone saying we should save the planet. And they said, don't worry about it. The planet will be fine. <laughs> we may go <laughs> as a species, 
the planet may decide to shrug us off and say, we tried humanity, not so good. <laughs> the next planetary conference, don't recommend it. We gave it 50,000 years, it ended in tears. <laughs> so the planet will continue. But his point was, uh, Rob, uh, Robert Witkin, is that there is a world that exists whether or not we exist. Um, it's the outer world of objects and events and physicality and of other people. But he said, there is also a world that exists only because you exist. It's the world that came into being when you did and will end or change according to your beliefs when your physical being ceases to be. Um, it's the world of your private consciousness, of your own being. And whereas we all make attempts to know the outside world, nobody can truthfully know the detail of your inner world. It's the world that Ardy Lang once said, in which there's only really one set of footprints. It's your own inner world of consciousness. Um, well, what we constantly try to do is to bridge these two. We try to relate the one to the other. We try to often to understand ourselves in terms of the other. I think the problems that have arisen in education because of our obsession with a certain type of rationalism is that we spend a great deal of time in education now getting children focused on the external world giving them data and information about it. And increasing that world is becoming more and more distracting and kaleidoscopic um, and insistent. I'm sure that is one of the contributions to people's lack of attention, uh, the constant flickering of data. But our education systems are remorselessly turned outwards to the outer world. When what kids and all of us desperately need to is time to look inward and to dwell in that inner space, where in the end, um, we find the only things that truthfully make sense for us. And education is increasingly poor at giving people techniques to look inward and to understand the relationship between the two. You see, science, if I can caricature it, seems to me, the primary purpose of science, and I'm a great advocate for science education, but the primary, and I've written a lot about the creativity of science, but broadly speaking, Sciences, broadly speaking, the physical sciences, are directed to understanding the external world in its own terms. It seems to me that the enterprise of science is explanation. We're trying to figure things out and to be as objective as we can. I don't think objective means true, and we might talk about that. You can be objective and wrong. And the history of science is of people being perfectly objective but wrong, um, but trying to be right. Uh, but people have often believed things to be factually correct, which turn out to be nonsense. Um, the role of the arts, I think, is, is self-consciously to manage this relationship between the inner and outer world. It's to, and the, the aim of an artist is not so much to explain their experience, but to describe it, to give an account of it in objects that somehow convey that sense of perception. Well, I think we pay a high price for the exile of feeling in education, this remorseless turning out and the failure to help people engage with what's within them. I believe that what identifies us as human beings, above all, are the powers that flow from our uh, deep resource of imagination. That's why I write such a lot about creativity. If you ask, you know, for, the, for most of the past 50,000 years, we have lived harmoniously with the rest of life on Earth. Our ancestors did. In the last 300 years, which is a blink of an eye, we've taken off like a rocket and are about to bring the house down around our ears. And what accounts for it? What is it that makes us so different? Because in most respects, we're like the rest of life on Earth. We're mortal, organic, no different from them. Lives are short. But what makes us different? Why are we sitting in a building that we've made you know, rather than sitting outside while all the dogs are sitting in here, you know, or <laughs> you know, all, all the lemurs and the squirrels sitting having meetings and we're outside in the trees trying to figure out what to eat. You know, there is a difference. And the difference is that we have evolved this powerful sense of imagination, the ability to bring to mind things that aren't here. And from it flow all kinds of powers, like creativity, and uniquely and distinctively the power of empathy. 
the ability to put yourself in somebody else's position and to imagine what that might be like. What happens in all times of conflict and cruelty is we shut empathy off so that we can do things that are unimaginable. And the way we avoid that is by kindling our imaginations and making those things unimaginable in turn. Empathy, essentially, in imagination are the things that make us human and the powers that flow from it, creativity and intuition. So it seems to me we have two big challenges in education. One of them is to have a more unified conception of what it is to be a person. One that recognises that feeling and knowing are parts of the same complex of a whole being, that our feelings are forms of perception, and they're affected by what we think, by our frameworks of ideas. They're affected by how well we can express ourselves and the languages we have available to do that. So part of the task of education is to connect ourselves with ourselves. And I think the reason so many people get depressed and lost is they have lost the connection with themselves. They have no sense of purpose. Carl Jung said this. He said in his 30 years of professional practice, he said there wasn't a single person who came to see him whose uh, malaise, he said, couldn't in the end be attributed to a loss of faith in religion. Now, I don't think he meant, and I certainly don't mean in quoting him, organized religion. I think the word I would use, and perhaps he would have accepted, would be spirituality, a sense of your spirit. But he said, in the end, nobody either, nobody either got well without regaining a sense of spiritual connection. So part of the task of education is to connect ourselves with ourselves. But the other great task is to connect with each other through the power of empathy, uh, through the power of um, intuition and mutuality. And all those things get lost in, in, in an industrialized, homogenized, atomized system of education. And the price couldn't be higher. And we're paying it every day in disaffection, disengagement, and emotional turmoil. Now, I don't say education is the whole of it, but we contribute to it. Um, it's the old Marxist principle, isn't it? You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And we have to be careful not to be part of the problem. So what do we do about it? So let me queue up the conversation I hope we're going to have. I think, at any rate, there are uh, a number of practical strategies we should think about. The first is that we have to recognise that education is personal. If you make education impersonal, people pull away from it or pull out of it or just disengage. It interests me that all the remedial programmes in education are based on personalised curricula. I was at a meeting in LA the other week about alternative education to get kids back into school. Alternative education is based on always the same thing, always the same thing, on personalised curricula, on um, close working relationships between teachers and students, negotiated programmes, and collaboration, group work, and mutual support. And I remember saying to this meeting, it's interesting that's called alternative education. Because <laughs> that's really education. It's the alternative that's causing the problem. <laughs> you know, we should call all the mainstream stuff alternative education and get on to the, the good stuff. I, I feel this, by the way, in all the work I, I do, I, I feel I stand in a very long tradition of people who've been arguing for something like this for a very long time. Um, you can, there are precursors and ancestors for every argument I ever think I put. You know, whether it's Bruner or Piaget or Montessori or... Um, or Pestalozzi or Friebel, all in their different ways. People have been arguing for holistic approaches to education since we had education. It's just the mainstream has rocketed away into this, uh, on these rails of conformity. And I think it's time to make the alternative into the mainstream. So personalising it is a big piece of it, and we might talk a bit about that. The second is, I believe, we have to put the arts back into education. The arts are not only, but among the prime ways in which we um, negotiate our own understanding of ourselves and the world around us. It's through music and art and theatre and dance, all the things that are marginalised, uh, that we express our own unique individual humanity. Not just doing them, but learning about them, learning about other cultures through them, and creating our own unique forms of expression in the process. The arts should be at the centre of this. Not instead of, but foursquare alongside the humanities and the sciences and physical education. I think a school that marginalises the arts is not doing education. They might be doing something else, some version of it, but if you leave out of account one of these major areas of human growth and development, then you're not doing the job. It's, I think it's as simple as that. And the final thing is this. 
that we, can, we are learning more and more through studies of the brain, through the fusions of ancient meditative uh, processes um, about what's increasingly being called mindfulness. Uh, there are practical things, techniques that we can use in classrooms to get children to focus in on themselves, to create some calm in their lives, some points of meditation, some points of practice, which if they became routine, I think, uh, would start to show themselves in the change in the overall culture of education. And uh, we're going to be hearing some more about those in the conversation we're about to have. But those particular things seem to me at the heart of it. But they're all versions of personalizing education. But the root of it to me is that they all point to a different metaphor for education. You see, most of our systems of education are mechanistic, I think. They're kind of uh, data-driven and, um, and impersonal. The trouble is that human beings are not mechanisms, we are organisms. And schools are like organisms too. And if you create certain cultures, people flourish, and in other cultures they tend to feel demeaned and to pull away. So to me, it's about looking again at the nature of the culture of the school, the vibrancy of the school. Recognizing that we're all unique individuals, but that together we create unique patterns and forms of behavior, which we can change. I've seen terrible schools improve in the space of six months when a new te head teacher came in and saw the potential to make people work differently. I've seen great schools go down for the opposite reason. Schools have much more freedom, I think, than we often believe we do. Um, there's nothing, I think, in the legislation we all operate within that says that you have to have 40-minute periods in high schools, that you have to have separate subject departments. How the school is run is really about the leadership of the school and the collective will of the people who work within it. But there's, we pay a high price for the current system, but there's a great prize in the new one. There was a wonderful quote. Do you remember Anais Nin, the poet? She once said, and interesting, she used an organic metaphor. She said of herself that there came a point in her own, her own life, in a way, where she had to be true to herself. She said, there came a point when the pain of remaining tight in a bud was greater than the pain it took to blossom. I just thought that was lovely. Um, but I think it's true in, for all of us that very often the, the pain of containing uh, our consciousness or our failure to understand ourselves is greater than the pain it would take to go on the journey to make it happen. And I think that's true in schools. The pain of containing people who are being disengaged is more than the effort it would take to reconnect with them if we changed our metaphors. And I think if we do, I think as we sit here at this point in humanity's growth and development, um, we may be feeling that shift. I know Eckhart Tolle writes about that, but he calls, he subtitles his book, uh, A New Earth, a f The Flowering of Human Consciousness. It's, again, it's an organic metaphor. But I think it's true. I feel a shift as I go around the world, and I, th I think you can sense it in lots of ways that people are doing. It's often a long revolution, but I think it's beginning to unfold. But if we go with it, if we understand that these things are our making and that we can remake them, that education and human life is organic and it's a matter of culture, if we get the culture right, then I think we'll witness a harvest of human flourishing that will amaze us. Thank you. <laughs>